Part one. You will hear part of a telephone conversation between a job seeker and a recruitment agent. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Yes, so that's Janet Thompson. Would you like me to spell it? If you wouldn't mind, thank you. Just the surname, please. No problem. It's T H O M P S O N. Great. Now, Janet, before we go through the openings I have here in front of me, might I just take a few more details to complete your profile on my system? Of course. What would you like to know? Well, let's start with your email address, please. Okay, Jan Thompson at hort dot net. I see. Is that Jan as in J A N? No, that wasn't available. I had to make do with J A double N. Here, let me spell it for you again, just to be sure. J A double N T H O M P S O N at hort dot net. Much obliged. And could I ask, do you have your referee details to hand? Yes. What do you need? I need one work reference and one character reference from a friend or colleague. Okay. For a work reference, there's Jane Foot. She's my former boss at Bermuda Girls School, head of English. Okay. My personal referee is Monica Carbody. Mon and I have been best friends since we met in Bermuda in 1991, when she was deputy head of English under Mrs. Foot. Perfect. And you mentioned, of course, that you're an English teacher. But are there any additional subjects you're qualified to teach? Yes, I have a diploma in special needs, and I can also do history to GCSE level. Very good. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Now listen and answer questions seven to ten. Do you think I stand a good chance of finding something? Oh, better than good. In fact, we have some positions we can offer you today. You see, it's not so difficult to find a temporary role. Tell you the truth, there are plenty of them around, but getting a permanent position will prove a little more trying, though. Would you be prepared to take up a position short term? Of course, anything that pays. Excellent. Well, there are three positions that I can offer you right now. The first is a teacher of English in LaSalle School. I'm sure you know it, right in the city centre. Yes, near where I live, actually. Even better. Well, it's a six-month contract, and the very attractive thing about this role is that the head of English at LaSalle will, if she's satisfied with your performance after six months, offer to make you a permanent member of staff. Wow, that's food for thought. It certainly is, bearing in mind what I said before about how hard it is to find a permanent role. The second position I have to offer you is in a school near Chelsea. It's called the Chelsea Free School. Are you familiar? I can't say that I've heard of it. Well, this contract is for one year, which is a lot better, looking at it from a short-term job security perspective, than the first role I mentioned. But you also have to realise that you are a temporary replacement for a female teacher who has taken maternity leave. There is no prospect of the position being made permanent. I see. I have one other vacancy at the minute. Though I doubt you'll find it quite so appealing, it's situated in rural Cambridgeshire. I'll spell that just in case you want to take it down: C A M B R I D G E S H I R E. And the school simply goes by the name Cambridge, though it's not in any way related to the other more well-known establishment of the same name. I was just going to ask that. What a lovely location, though, eh? Yes, but there's a catch. It's only a six-week contract to cover for someone on extended sick leave. I see. Well, I guess that's ruled out then. What sort of sort of salary can I? 
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a radio program on the process of making beer. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. Hello and welcome to Gourmet Evening. And this week we're looking at the world's popular beverage, a great favourite today, beer. And in the studio to tell us all about it is Clark Maxwell. Beer is one of my personal favourite beverages. And I've got a number of facts, tips and trivia about beer to share with you. So, who invented beer and when? What is beer made of? Actually, historians are not entirely sure when beer was invented, but they guess that beer was created accidentally by early nomadic tribes roughly 10,000 years ago. The four primary ingredients are malt, hops, yeast and water. Malt, which gives the beer a sweet taste, is made from barley soaked in water until its husks open and sprout. The sprouts are then dried and crushed. The small flowers of the hops vine are added partly because they taste bitter, helping balance the sweetness of the malt. Hops prevent the growth of bacteria that can spoil beer. Yeast is responsible for fermentation, which creates the alcohol and carbonation. Beer makers sometimes use additives or substitutes for malt or hops. Substitutes such as corn or rice can make a beer lighter or cheaper to produce. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Adding fruit gives beer a fruity taste. Beer is not high in alcohol, as we know. The lowest type, light beer, contains no more than 2% alcohol, and the highest may reach 6%. Other drinks, such as wine, are more alcoholic. Wine contains 8 to 20% alcohol. But that is not to say drinking beer is no danger at all. Like all alcoholic beverages, beer can make it difficult to drive and think clearly. Excessive drinking can also lead to liver damage, high blood pressure, stomach ulcers and other health problems. However, beer also helps prevent some health problems when consumed in moderation. Beer contains a moderate number of vitamins and minerals. Studies have shown that small amounts of alcohol can reduce the risk of heart disease. Beer also contains selenium, a mineral that promotes bone growth and helps reduce the risk of osteoporosis. I suppose many of you think beer can give you a beer belly, but you are mistaken. Genes determine how fat is deposited. No food or drink can create fat deposits in specific areas of the body. As with all foods, the more calories you consume, the more likely they are to be stored as fat and cause weight gain. Beer contains no fat and averages 150 calories per serving. Well, one more thing. 
Pay attention to the storage and containers of beer. They will affect its taste. It's a mistake that the taste of beer improves with age, like that of some wines. Beer is a food product that will eventually become stale. It should be stored in a cool, dark location before consumption, and the color of a bottle can influence the flavor. Brown bottles block out light that reacts with the hops, which could damage the flavor. Green or clear bottles provide little or no protection from light damage. Do you know which country drinks the most beer? Although Britain is even on the list of big consumers, actually the Czech Republic consumes the most beer at 156 liters per person per year, followed by Ireland and Germany. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a talk on ocean spills. As you listen to the talk, circle the appropriate letter for questions twenty-one to twenty-three. First, look at questions twenty-one to twenty-three. As you listen, answer the questions. Good morning, everyone. Today I'll talk about unusual ocean spills that have occurred in the world's oceans. In November of 1992, people at beaches in Canada and Alaska noticed something strange: blue turtles, red beavers, green frogs, and yellow ducks came bobbing toward them. They soon found out where the strange creatures were coming from. A ship from Hong Kong was on its way to Tacoma, Washington, when it was hit by a severe storm in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. During the storm, huge waves washed twelve containers overboard. Inside the containers were twenty-nine thousand plastic bath toys. One of the containers opened. And thousands of plastic bath toys spilled out and began to float across the Pacific Ocean. Ten months later, the first yellow ducks arrived on the North American shore. Beachcombers along the shore began to find the toys and reported them to local newspapers. But the people who were most excited by the plastic toys were the oceanographers. It gave them an opportunity to study ocean currents and winds. Before the conversation continues, look at questions twenty-four to thirty. Now listen to the second part of the discussion. Oceanographers drop bottles into the ocean to study these things, but it would be too expensive to drop twenty-nine thousand bottles into the ocean at once. Imagine the value of studying the plastic ducks and frogs. This gave some interesting information to the oceanographers. The first toys were picked up. In Sitka, Alaska, 
ten months after they were washed off the ship. Some headed back into the North Pacific, while others drifted around the Arctic Ocean and headed for the North Atlantic. Many of the toys were swept northeast by the wind and were frozen in the ice of the Bering Sea. They're expected to cross the North Pole and float on down to the British Isles. This reminds me of another unusual ocean spill. In 1990, a ship traveling to the west coast of the United States from Korea was caught in a severe storm. The waves swept 21 containers of Nike shoes into the water. Scientists estimate that about 80,000 running, jogging, and hiking shoes, 40,000 pairs of shoes to you and me, hit the water at once. The shoes were for men, women, and children. About six months later, people at beaches from Oregon to British Columbia began to find running shoes washed ashore. By the end of the year, Washington newspapers reported people finding hundreds of shoes. In Seattle, thousands of shoes floated to shore. Since the shoes were not attached, they arrived one at a time. The shoes were dirty, but after they were washed, they were still in good condition. People set up exchanges to find matches for their shoes. Oceanographers studied the information to learn more about the ocean. Some Nike shoes reached Hawaii. Others went to the Philippines and Japan. According to the scientists, some of the shoes are on a trip around the world and should end up back in Washington and Oregon. Can you believe it? Many pairs of running shoes, as well as plastic ducks and frogs, are still on their ocean journey. So if you go to a beach anywhere in the world, don't be surprised if you see a green plastic frog or a woman's size seven jogging shoe bobbing toward you. So keep your eyes out, so you may find free bath toys and even a new pair of shoes. Thank you for attending my lecture. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk given by Jim Allen. He is going to share some of his findings of his research. Now you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now, listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning. Today we'll be hailing from Jim Allen, who will be sharing some of the findings of his research project from last term. Jim. Thanks. Well, to start with, a little bit of background about the project. As you can see, our title is something that is relevant to everybody in this part of the world: water safety. These days, there's a lot more to water safety. Because of the increasing number and range of boats and other things people use on public waterways, I'd become interested through reports on radio about the number of incidents involving small power boats and individual watercraft such as jet skis. It seemed to me that because these craft were essentially recreational, 
and didn't require licenses to use, there was very little opportunity to influence the users towards being safety conscious. So, I decided to make this the focus of the project. For the research, we mainly relied upon talking to people, asking them questions in preference to using a written questionnaire. We interviewed a wide range of people at a number of popular swimming locations over two consecutive weekends and asked them what they'd observed or experienced themselves. The respondents were both male and female, but the men were just slightly in the majority. We were pleased with their willingness to talk about the subject and all told, interviewed 145 people over the two weekends. So, what were the findings? As you can see, 86% of people reported having had some type of problem. A surprisingly large percentage, 27%, commented that they had found it necessary to shout at an offending powerboat. But the main type of problem was the deafening sound that some of the boats made. On occasions, this led to swimmers deciding to move to another location. So what strategies did people adopt to ensure their own comfort and safety? Let's have a look at the figures. First, it was noticeable that there were often distinctly different answers between men and women. It was mainly the women, for example, who said they should try to choose places where boats couldn't go, whereas it was usually the men who said you shouldn't have to move if you were there first, so you should shout at them if necessary. Both men and, oh, sorry, no, it was women who said you should call the authorities if the situation gets too dangerous or the powerboat drivers are acting irresponsibly. Then, I had thought it would be mainly women, but both sexes made the point that above all, it's important to get children away from any possible danger. Men were very aware that jet skis could be unpredictable in inexperienced hands. They also made the point that it's much safer to have your car nearby and clearly visible to any watercraft if you're swimming in a relatively remote spot. Finally, wearing visible clothing, men didn't think it was quite as important as women, but both gave it a high safety rating. When we asked them what they thought the government should do to help solve the problem, That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thank you.